You're listening to Digging In, brought to you by Concept Agritech. Visit us on the web at conceptagritech.com. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us here today. Dr. James White is joining us from Rutgers University. Dr. White is well known for his research on the endophytic microbes of plants and his work with the rise of phagy cycle. Currently, his lab is exploring the diversity of endophytes and their impact on host plants. Dr. White, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Oh, thank you, Laura. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Really excited to dive into this conversation here today and let you share your research with our listeners. So to get right to things, let's start by talking about this important concept of farming. So not farming in the traditional sense, but of plants farming the bacteria and the fungi that they need. So I'll turn things over to you, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can share with us what the rhizophagy cycle is and why we need to be keeping it top of mind. I, I love the way you put that, the farming. We'll talk about farming to begin with, which is really relevant to farming as in the big farming, right? Out in the, out in the field. Uh, yeah, these micro, these plants are doing something that we never thought that that they would do, and uh, they are actually cultivating soil microbes and internalizing those microbes into their tissues and extracting nutrients from them. And uh, basically, basically what they're what they're doing is uh, plant. Plant roots are secreting exudates, which are sugars and other nutri other uh, amino acids and organic acids and other other chemicals. But they the plant roots secrete these exudates in order to attract soil bacteria, and so soil bacteria follow this exudate, this nutrient stream coming out of the root out of root tips. They follow that and they go right to the root tip. And uh, the plant then cultivates them right at the root tip and then will take some of them in to the cells. And uh, this is a little bit radical, but um, they, uh, the, bac the bacteria actually enter into the root cells themselves at that root tip. And uh, then what happens is the, uh, the plant, once it gets these bacteria inside it, inside the cells, it will hit these bacteria with reactive oxygen, superoxide, really. And that superoxide will begin the, the job of extracting nutrients out of the out of bacteria. And uh, that nutritional process gives plants, uh, gives plants actually a, a lot of micronutrients, uh, manganese and iron and, and uh, magnesium and zinc and, and Night and, and macronutrients like calcium and nitrogen and potassium and phosphorus, but it's really important for these micronutrients absorption into plants that uh, that they have the rhizophagy cycle, and uh, the 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 reason it's a cycle is because when those bacteria go in and then they're hit with superoxide to extract nutrients from them. Uh, some of the bacteria actually survive that process and they they are the survivors actually are replicated inside these root cells and they will trigger uh, root hair formation and uh, without those bacteria you have no root hairs uh, on roots they just don't elongate those bacteria have to be there and the reason that the bacteria have to be there is well not only they provide nutrients but they also produce uh, growth hormones, and the the bacteria themselves produce growth hormones that enable the root hairs to elongate. And with, without them, you don't have no elongation. When those root hairs elongate, bacteria are ejected back out into the soil. Okay, and then they'll reform their cell walls, and then they'll go back into the soils. When if they have flagella, they'll reform those. They'll go back into the soil, get nutrients, and then later to be attracted back to the tip. So this is the cyclic process where the microbes are cycling between a phase in the soil, free living phase in the soil, where they get nutrients in the soil, uh, and 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 uh, a phase inside roots. Uh, we call that uh, endophytic, endophytic, or endophyte, meaning endophyte, meaning plant. It is a phase where these bacteria and and sometimes yeasts 
uh, are actually inside the the plant and dependent on the plant. The plant is actively manage, managing them in this endophytic phase and getting nutrients from them in the endophytic phase. It's a really interesting process that, uh, yeah. So this is counter to everything that we learn in Plant Science 101, it seems like. So you know, the the roots are taking up the nutrients, the root hairs are taking up the nutrients yeah. in the water. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what you're sharing is that these roots are actually putting things back into the soil as well. They are. They're they're putting those microbes back out. In fact, when they when they pump the microbes out of the tips of root hairs, uh, they will actually put a little bit of exudate, a little bit of sugars to go out with those microbes. They just inject them right out of the tip put sugars there so that the, the, then they can reform their cell walls so and flagella so they can be uh, competent for soil living again, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, once, that, once that happens, the microbes are now competent. But yeah, the idea being, you know, what is the role of the root hair? And uh, 10 years ago, I think everyone would have said, well, the role of the root hair probably the only role of a root hair is to absorb nutrients for, that are solubilized in, in, uh, in soil liquid, right? I mean, that's, that's what we think. The root hair goes out there and it interfaces with soil water and then it absorbs nutrients in the soil water. And that may be true. They may be doing that, but that's definitely not the only role. And I would suggest that it's not the main role of root hairs, that root hairs instead tend to be uh, elevators on plants or, or it's a structure on plants to move those microbes back out into the soil in the rhizosphere where nutrients can be acquired mm -hmm. uh, again. So they're moving microbes. And, and if I heard correctly, you're also saying that without these bacteria, we have no root hairs to begin with. So the bacteria are responsible for the development of the root hairs. Did I hear that correctly? That is correct. They're totally responsible for the development of the root hairs. Without them, you get no root hair formation. We can we can remove microbes and you get no root hair formation on roots. We can use antibiotics to suppress microbes and you get no root hair formation on the roots. You have to have those microbes for that. So that links actually root hairs um, directly to uh, these microbes and, and less, probably less directly to absorbing nutrients. I mean, we would expect that, okay, if a plant, if it doesn't have anything to do with microbes, you put the plant in the soil, you give it uh, fertilizer and you should get root hair elongation, right? Mm -hmm. Because if it's about nutrient absorption, well, it, it, it doesn't work like that. And you have to have microbes to get that root hair elongation. And, and this is something that you're learning from a plant science standpoint, not from a specific crop standpoint. Is that correct? That's correct. Is all plants do this? Some variations of it, and uh, in fact, we're 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 thinking we're thinking all land plants. Even when we go back and look at the earliest land plants. We have a graduate student starting this this year, and she's going to actually look at that transition from aquatic environment to the terrestrial environment. The early land plants, right, and then the aquatic, the algae, and look and see if we see differences there. Uh, our hypothesis is that what we're going to see is that these land plants are doing this, but the aquatic plants probably not. And the, the, I mean, likely that plants, when they moved onto land, I don't know, this is way ahead of it, but it's possible that when plants moved onto land, we'll see what she finds, right? She's a graduate student just starting. But I mean, this is what it looks like so far, is that, that when plants moved to land, they started like rhizophagy cycle. Mm -hmm. They well, started at the... That's so exciting. Like. And it, it's, it, it's groundbreaking. It if you think about, you know, where we've come just in the past decade in what we know about soil science and, and plant science really as well. Um, talk a little bit more about the rise of AG cycle. So it, from my understanding, that's a process that was, or excuse me, a discovery that was actually named and implemented in Australia. Is that correct? Yeah, the rhizophagy, what happened is there's a group in Australia, Queensland, Australia, uh, that is working, that was working on, um, I think they were working on endophytes really. Uh, and what they, what they did is they labeled their bacteria and a yeast actually, they labeled it with a fluorescent tag, GFP, right? 
green fluorescent protein. Just it, basically, it's where you put a tag on it, on an organism, and then you can track it using fluorescence microscopy. You can see where it goes. And what they showed is when they did that, they fed it to Arabidopsis, which is the 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 one of the plant science guinea pig organisms, right? right? <laughs> yeah, which is useful, but it has some limitations if everyone's working on this one plant. But anyways, it was useful for them. They put they put an E. coli in and they also put a yeast in of Saccharomyces, labeled Saccharomyces. And they found that uh, in tomato and also in Arabidopsis, they found that it went into the roots, to the root cells. And then they found it in the root hairs. And this was in 2010. They reported that in a in a paper in the journal PLOS One and uh, titled something like uh, Turning the Table, Plants Consume Microbes as a Source of Nutrients, right? Turning the, instead of, right, microbes consume plants as a source of nutrients. So, but they published that, and uh, what we what we've done uh, is um, since then is we've worked out the details of the rise of, of. We actually showed it's a cyclic process, defined it as cyclic, and showed how it's cyclic, and are trying to find how the to learn how the system works. So the aspects of de- degrading uh, plants, uh, you de- degrading microbes using reactive oxygen, that is a radically different. Uh, uh, addition to it, the way this system works, it, it is really here's here's something, Laura. You you know you said uh, this is something very different than uh, than what we knew about how plants work. It is very different, I and mean, this is basically, I mean, just to say something cute. This is not our mothers and fathers agronomy, right? This is not. <laughs> this is not that. This is different this comes out of a different field this because in my lab and a, a lot of other labs around the world they focus on endophytes right so we're looking we're looking intently at these microbes in detail at these microbes that go into plant tissues and so uh, this is the area that where this knowledge comes from now if you think of agronomy you know mostly we're you know it's about soil structure it's about mm-hmm. It's about chemistry, right? It's a different way of thinking. This is a whole different field. So this is coming from this new field, uh, moving into agronomy now, moving into plant science. Right. And that's, I was actually going to say that is, you know, you make such an important point talking about this is not your mother's agronomy because, (laughs) you know, this, this is something that we've had the technology to have discovered this two, three decades ago, but sometimes we get so stuck in our own way of doing things in our own processes that we overlook important parts. And I think this is a perfect example of this. This research is fairly young. Why has it, why had it not been discovered before? I, it's a really good question. I've thought a lot about it. And I think the main reason is because people didn't, did not look at these microbes in plant tissues very much. They assumed that microbes in plant tissues are disease agents mostly, right? And so they figured if they ever, if there was a microbe in there, then uh, it must be bad. Uh, uh, when in fact, plants are really filled, they filled themselves with these microbes to get nutrients, you know, they're, they're, they're sucking them in. And so the processes inside the plant, what the plant is doing, how the plant is interacting with these microbes, nobody ever went to that. And, and the other thing is, it's a phenomenon, this is something like, exactly what you said, this is a phenomenon that involves uh, human perception, what humans can perceive, right? We perceive what our minds are prepared to accept and to see, right? And and if we're not prepared to see it, if, for example, uh, we, we think that only pathogenic bacteria may enter plant cells and that anything in a plant cell, if a plant cell is healthy, it must be an organelle of, a, a, you know, a mitochondrion or a chloroplast or something like that, uh, a natural part of the plant. Uh, but to go the next uh, step and say, well, those may be microbes that are in that plant, other organisms in that plant cell, 
that has been a, something that is very hard for people to pass because, you know, our concept, and this goes to exactly what you said, you know, we have our ideas about how things work. And if something doesn't fit with what we, how we think things work, then we won't even see it. We just don't see it. We just don't see it. Yes. Well, we are a very visual society. I, I, you know, I, I think that's a hallmark of what we do in agriculture. We like to see the fruit of our labor. And a lot of times when you're talking about microbes and you're talking about, you know, micronutrients and these exchanges, it, it takes different conditions. It takes different seasons to see that kind of a buildup and to see the, the advantages of that. Yeah, it, it, it does. And uh, it, it actually, I mean, I think one reason why the, this work on rhizophagy cycle has been more, and endophytes have been more, have been well received, is because people have always, at least a major groups of agriculturists, have and and gardeners have always believed that microbes are important, soil biology is important, and so when they when when people see. You know, as they have this inclination. They think it's important, but why is it important, right? When they see that the plants are actually absorbing these bacteria and yeasts, other fungi, into, into the root cells and ex hit them with superoxide to get nutrients out of them, that, that makes all the sense in the world. So it's seeing. It's seeing it. And, I mean, that's one reason why uh, the I always talk about this because – I think it's a powerful concept when you know, when people know how plants are treating these microbes. And it, it's, it, you know, if you know that's happening, then it opens up this whole other way of feeding plants and taking care of plants now through supporting the microbes, the, so, the, the so-called soil biology, right? The soil biology, supporting that and you support your plant. And it's a different strategy than putting uh, – chemicals, you know, chemical fertilizers uh, directly on the plant. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, a, it's a totally different strategy. In fact, too much fertilizer will inhibit rhizophagy cycle. So they're not uh, entirely compatible. And uh, plants, plants that are doing rhizophagy cycle uh, are you know, getting, they get more nutrients, they get more nutrients from microbes, but they, they also are interacting with those microbes oxidatively. And that means that those plants, uh, when they're getting nutrients from the microbes, they're using superoxide and other forms of reactive oxygen. And that makes them to upregulate or to express more of their oxidative stress traits like uh, antioxidants and, and other kinds of chemicals that make them resistant to, to reactive oxygen. And that makes them stress tolerant. So, Plants that are doing rhizophagy are more stress tolerant than plants that you feed with fertilizer. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. When I hear the words reactive and oxygen, I think about stress. I think about plant stress. So does a plant have to be stressed to undergo the rhizophagy cycle? What does plant health, um, the onset of plant health from you know the get-go right out of the gate, what does that do for the rhizophagy cycle? Obviously, it takes a healthy plant to to complete these cycles. It what it does for the what it does for the plant is it will make the plant more resistant to any kind of stress. Right? They'll heart they'll be hardier if there's a if there is a um, like a heat wave or salt in the soil. You know, heat stress, salt stress. You know, whatever it is. You know, the plant is going to be more. It's going to be tougher. It's going to be tougher than plants that are feeding feed, we feed with fertilizer. Also, diseases. If you're if you're feeding the plant with microbes with soil biology, right? Uh, then the plant is going to the plant is going to be uh, more disease hardy because those microbes actually will the bacteria that are involved in the rhizophagy cycle go out into the soil and they'll colonize potential pathogens and reduce their virulence. So the, the fungi like fusarium, instead of causing disease on your plant, will grow on the roots as an endophyte and, and actually benefit the plant in that case. So, so this behavior change is very important. 
the because the soil, the, the plant microbes that are cycling through will change the behavior of pathogenic fungi in the soil and make them a virulent, non-virulent, right? Make them so they don't cause disease. So, so yeah. Well, I, I know we've, we've had this conversation before. Let's talk about seed treatment okay. um, yeah. and what happens because we know that there is a microbiome around the seed or on the seed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we already have some beneficial bacteria that that seed is, has cultivated, um, you know, as offspring from the parent plant. What happens when we use synthetic fertilizers um, and, and what happens when we do seed treatments? What are we actually doing to the... Um, the, the bacteria that is colonized on that seed. So uh, that's a very important point, Laura. The, the um, seeds naturally, uh, besides having the, the baby embryo in them, they also carry the microbiome of the plant, of the mama plant. And uh, the, the, the microbiome uh, is necessary to give that seedling a start. And if you if we remove all the all the microbes from us from seeds, which we could do by surface sterilization, you get a lot of uh, we get a lot of disease. The, the seeds don't develop properly, uh, roots don't form properly, uh, and you get a lot of disease on those seeds. So, uh, but the microbiome actually requires development. It requires a period of moisture on the plant to fully develop. And if you if you're if you're if you're treating plants seeds for example with uh, anything that sterilizes them, you're going to remove microbes. Uh, if, if for example you're trying to kill uh, fungi that may be on your on your seed by by using a, a sterilant on seeds, you, you're going to have there's going to be non-target effects on these other bacteria that are really that are really important for the seedling. And so you diminish that. And what you're going to see is there's more and more disease uh, in your, in your seedlings. In fact, what people have done is, for example, if, uh, if you consider a plant uh, like a Bermuda grass, right? Bermuda grass is a common warm season grass that's grown in warmer parts of the United States and other countries. But the Bermuda grass, Frequently, it has a well. It has a husk on the seed, and the microbes are carried on that husk. And when people, when companies will sometimes remove that husk, uh, frequently move the remove the husk to get more even germination. But what happens is, because you remove the microbes, then there's more disease, and so then they coat the seed with with fungicides, you know, which causes, which yeah, reduce some of the fungal, the damping off and stuff that they see. Okay. But, um, the, 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 they've lost their microbiome and they're going to have, they're still going to have some problems. They're going to have some developmental problems and they're going to have, they're still going to have some more disease, even though they have those fungicides there. Uh, they wouldn't have to do that if the micro, they wouldn't have to use the fungicides if the microbiome was intact on that seed. Uh, so anything, cotton seeds, for example, cotton seeds, we destroy the microbiome on cotton seeds. We dip them in acid to remove the fibers. It eats the fibers away, but the microbes are carried on those fibers. And so we destroy the microbiome. And what do we see with cotton? We see a crop that has to have all kinds of fertilizers and fungicides and all kinds of herbicides, everything to grow the cotton. So what is the process? How do we rebuild that microbiome? So, you know, we're having a production agriculture conversation and these practices are, are likely not going to stop. How do we rebuild that microbiome for a seedling for that developing plant? What are some things that we can do to give it an advantage, even if those seeds are treated? Uh, I, I mean, there are, there, there are ways that you can add microbes to seeds when you germinate them. There are products out there and uh, many companies have products and uh, you know, they, some are better than others, but most of them work and especially in terms of disease control. Um, uh, it would be, what I would do is I would look for some of those products that you can access, you know, over the counter and uh, do some experiments with those to see if you, get boosts in your 
in your crop, in the crop plant. So I would do some experimentation with microbes that you can source from companies. That'd be the best way to do it. Uh, the other things that could be done is we could, um, uh, you know, we're always working on how you rebuild the microbiome and then, then how you, uh, how you then treat the plant in order to maintain a microbiome on the, on the seed and on the, and on the plant as you develop it. So this is going to take, you know, take a lot of work to figure all that out, but, um, But yeah, we're working on that too. So I just say experiment, try some microbes, put some microbes on it. Yeah, great to hear. So I cannot let you out of this conversation this morning without talking about your work in nitrogen fixing bacteria. It's such an important um, topic. It's such an important issue that we're looking at here today in production agriculture, moving away from synthetic fertilizers for you know a whole host of reasons. Um, tell us about what your work has looked like, what you've learned, and what you've important more importantly, what you've learned about the merits of these bacteria and how they can help us offset and break this cycle of, of synthetic fertilizer application. I, I think we're close. We're actually close to something really useful in that re- in that respect. Um, we're actually working with it, an organic corn breeder uh, named Walter Goldstein. Dr. Walter Goldstein at the Van Damen Institute in Wisconsin. And he is breeding, has been trying to breed for years, and we're trying to help him now to, to breed. And we just, we actually just got some funding support to, from the organic, uh, organic uh, breeding program uh, at the USDA. But uh, what we're doing is looking at some of these uh, land races from Mexico and South America and finding where those microbes are in the plant, where they how they how they distribute in the plant, and they're not on one place. You know, a plant like in this case corn, you know, you have tissues all over, different kinds of tissues, and so those tissues will have microbes in them producing nitrogen that the, will then move to the seeds of the plant. For example, those cob leaves that go around the leaves, those are an important place for nitrogen fixation. And for these land races, we can look at these land races and we can see that that they are filled uh, uh, with a very distinctive bacteria in the cob leaves and in the leaves, in the leaf epidermal layer, and in particular in trichomes, there is an association with trichomes, whereas a lot of these uh, nitrogen fixing microbes or what appears to that appear to accumulate nitrate actually are in the, the hairs, the plant hairs, you know, and, you know, we've always, mm-hmm. no one's known what, what, what are these plant hairs about? There's lots of speculation it's defense you know it's defensive you know maybe they keep an insect from biting in but a lot of these are soft walls they're not really they wouldn't be useful defensive and some of them many of them don't even produce noxic, noxious chemicals right so they wouldn't be useful there but as it turns out we can see nitrogen uh, nitrate forming around the bacteria inside these hairs trichomes plant hairs so that's a uh, so it's important, another another role, you know, these uh, root hairs and plant and, and leaf hairs, you know, they appear to be microbiome associated, both types of hairs, which is, which is really interesting. We had a great conversation. So Dr. White, I know you have things to get to really, really appreciate your time. It's always a pleasure to learn from you. Oh, it's my pleasure, Laura. Thank you. It's been really good working with you too. Thanks for listening. Get more information at conceptagritech.com.